What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. So the the key matchup in this particular game that kind of changed the way that Oklahoma City had to play offense is they put the Timberwolves put Jaden McDaniels on Chet Holmgren. One of the biggest things that Oklahoma City does on offense is they run ball screens with Chet and they have him pop to the top of the key. I've talked about this concept a lot on the show, but pick and pops are one of the hardest uh, actions to guard in the NBA with modern pick and roll coverages. Think of it like this. If your guard can shoot a pull-up jump shot, then my guard has to chase over the top. If my guard has to chase over the top, then I need a screen defender to funnel him into. Because if there's no screen defender and I chase over the top, you can imagine what would happen. If I'm guarding Shea and I'm chasing over the top of the screen, Shea's just going to go over the screen and go right at the basket. And if there's no help defender there, I'm not going to be able to get there in time to meet him at the rim. So that's why that that screen defender is essentially there waiting for you as the on-ball guy to funnel Shea into him. Well... That works pretty well in screen and roll because you can play what's called no roller behind coverage where like the roller is coming this way, the ball handler is coming this way, and I'm kind of splitting the difference between the two and trying to make them make a decision. And I, if I'm a big athletic center, can kind of cover enough ground to be a reasonable defensive option there. But if I pop to the three-point line, I can't contain the ball handler as the big man and also guard the guy at the top of the key. It's one of the easiest ways to get a defense in rotation. And that, by the way, is why these really skilled bigs, guys like Chet, guys like Sabonis, guys like Anthony uh, Davis, guys like Nicole Jokic, guys like Joel Embiid, can cause so many problems for teams in pick and pop. It just immediately gets the defense into rotation. It's one of the reasons why, by the way, I've been talking so much about Nicole Jokic's jump shot this season. Because last year he was just deadly on it. And so a lot of Denver's offense was pick and pop. Jokic pump fake as the guy's sprinting at him. Now he's coming downhill making decisions as he's barreling towards the rim, right? So like having a big man that could set a ball screen and force a traditional pick and roll coverage and pop to the top of the key and make plays there is huge. That is what Chet does for Oklahoma City. But when you put Jaden McDaniels, who, because Chet is kind of thin, is strong enough to avoid getting bullied by Chet, now they can switch any Chet ball screen with any of the ball handlers on the floor. And it completely changed the way that Oklahoma City had to play offense because now they're taking Chet off the ball and basically having him spot up. Shea uh, Shea Gilders-Alexander ran 12 isos in this game. He typically only runs about seven or eight a game. The, as a team, Oklahoma City averages 27 assists per game this season. They only had 21 against the Timberwolves. It became much more stagnant. It became a lot more Jalen Williams and Shea Gilders-Alexander playing one-on-one. It just was a, ch- more, a, a more challenging offensive game for Oklahoma City. Great example of some of the personnel uh, um, you know, kind of flexibility that you get by having a guy like Jaden McDaniels. And then on the flip side, having a guy like Chet, that as great as he's going to be at this phase of his career is a little too skinny. It can struggle in some specific matchups. And this was an example uh, of one of those matchups for Chet. And like Chet in general just had a really bad game. And I thought the way that that kind of dynamic kind of threw him out of whack went a long way. But to Shea Gildas Alexander and, and Jalen Williams' credit, they still had a lot of success creating their own shot in this game. But Minnesota's defense just kind of dis- dictated the flow of Oklahoma City's offense. They held them to just 101 points. Um, my, By the way, Oklahoma City is the sixth best offense in the league by offensive rating, and they got shut down. Minnesota has, according to Cleaning the Glass, a 112.5 defensive rating against the top 10 offenses in the league. Only Cleveland has been better. And so Minnesota consistently has been able to get their defense to translate against the top-tier offenses in the league. As I've said many times throughout the season, Minnesota's defense is for real. Um, It was a really good Anthony Edwards and Carl Towns decision-making game. Talked a lot about this over the course of the season. My main concern with Minnesota is they're an average clutch offense and they're an average half-court offense. And when you get into those really slow-down environments, that can be an issue. And specifically, it gets worse in the playoffs when you've got Anthony Edwards, who's very, very young, like very, very young. And I think he's going to be a very, very good player for a very, very long time. I think he's a bona fide superstar in the making, all that stuff. He's 21. So, like, he's just, he's young. And then Carl Towns, who's 
historically been a pretty poor decision maker in those environments. Well, this game was not one of those games. I thought Carl Towns and Ant were excellent on offense down the stretch of this game. They were making really good kickout passes to shooters. They weren't forcing things, which is a thing that the two of them have done from time to time in their careers. Uh, the Wolves had eight assists in 11 made field goals in that fourth quarter. They shot 58% of the field uh, from the field. Six of those eight assists were from Carl Towns and from Anthony Edwards. But at the same time, they brought the aggression when it made sense. Carl Towns hit a three off of like a flare screen at the top of the key. Anthony Edwards hit a pull-up three in pick and roll when the defender was too far back. Then there was this, I posted the clip of this one where Ant like rejected a ball screen like 30 feet from the basket and just rose up and just dunked it with two hands and probably got fouled on the play as well. I thought they were magnificent down the stretch of this particular game. Anthony Edwards was complaining after the game about officiating. I think the plays he's referencing, there, the dunk I mentioned, he got hit by SGA, that probably should have sent him to the line. Then there was a, a Jaden McDaniels foul on Shea kind of uh, at the right block where Shea kind of got into his body and was using his off arm, like literally like fighting Jaden off with his off arm. And Jaden was kind of grabbing at his off arm. So it was like hand fighting that should have been able to go both ways, but Jaden got called for the foul. And so I think Ant was just kind of getting at some of the inconsistencies. And again, I'm never going to go in on one particular team and how they're affected, but League-wide, it is an issue. League-wide, I think officiating is a massive issue around the league. So anytime a player brings it up, I'm obviously going to uh, support them within the context of the league-wide issue. But decision-making, like I said, that specific that specific dynamic of Ant and Carl Towns like making the right driving kick reads and not forcing tough shots and making sure guys stay in rhythm goes a long way towards this team's championship potential. They had a 157 offensive rating in the clutch situation against Oklahoma City last night. Um, that's been an issue for them all season. They've been a mediocre. I think they're. I think I mentioned in yesterday's show they've been below 109 offensive rating in clutch situations all season before last night. Really bad in the last like month or so. They were in that like a high 90s for offensive rating. That's not very good. I've said before, but. Clutch offense and half-court offense are the two closest replicas we have in the NBA regular season of playoff offense. And that's why I keep such a close eye on those two categories. And they've been mediocre in both categories all season long. But I thought last night was a big step in the right direction on that front for Minnesota. A couple other shout-outs. Jaden McDaniels hit a huge corner three in the right. Tight space, too. Quick release. Ant put a, shot, a pass right in the shooting pocket, and he knocked it down. He also had a huge tip in late in the game when the Thunder needed to stop and Anthony Edwards was tired. So he was like hiding in the right corner. They ran a ball screen for Nikhil Alexander Walker on the left side and he ended up forcing up a tough floater and he missed it. Uh, but Shea Gilders Alexander was guarding Jaden McDaniels on the right wing and Jaden noticed Shea had his head turned and wasn't paying attention. He just snuck right in front of him, got in there and got a huge tap in with his left hand that ended up being basically the dagger in this particular game. And then also I wanted to shout out Jordan McLaughlin. He's shooting the ball much better this year than he did last year. He had two massive threes in the second half. One off the catch and then one kind of off a ball screen where the defender ducked underneath the pick. And then as a result of that, he had a, a pump fake driving really tough scoop shot over Chet Holmgren uh, that kind of came from him making those first two threes and getting the defender to kind of chase him off the line. I thought he had a – that was a really important sequence in this particular game as Oklahoma City was making the run yeah, uh, in that second half. On the Thunder front. The core players are still slumping really hard. Josh Giddy started hot, made a few threes in a row, but then he finished cold. Lou Dort missed a bunch of shots in the second half, some good looks too. Chet had a really rough game. We talked about this in the power rankings yesterday, but this has been a theme for a little while now for OKC. Giddy, Dort, and, and Holmgren are all struggling right now. And as a result, Oklahoma City's offense is kind of tanking. And, you know, some of this is like young players can just be inconsistent, but I wanted to go over some specific ways, you know, not just for the Thunder, but also for young basketball players out there to help getting through a slump, because this is something that happens. You can have slumps. I, I personally, I, I was a very streaky shooter when I was playing in college. I had a conference play sequence one of the seasons I played where I shot like 50% from three and then I had a another stretch non-conference play like the very next year where I remember over the course of a week in like four games I missed 22 consecutive threes so like <laughs> like you can slump it happens it's part of the game right and I've learned as I've gotten older there are some specific things that I think work really well as it pertains to trying to get out of a slump first of all 
Lots more off-court work to try to polish things up. I know it sounds crazy, but you can derive confidence by knowing you've made that shot. When you're standing in the game and you go, I made 500 of these in the last two days, I have a much better chance of making it today. So off-court work is a big one. Two, better offensive process. And some of this is matchup related. We talked about the the switching that uh, the OKC could do by using Jaden McDaniels to switch any sort of, uh, uh, of ball screen, right? involving Chet Holmgren, and that can stagnate teams and prevent drive and kick, but you can still generate drive and kick rotation situations by hunting drive and kick instead of hunting ISO. What I mean by that is like, rather than getting into your dribble combinations and trying to hunt a pull-up jump shot, just think, I got to beat this dude off the dribble so that I can draw a help defender and get the ball moving around. As the ball is popping around, it just adds a rhythm and a flow to the offense that gives guys a better chance of making shots. And then lastly, gain confidence in other areas of the game. This was a big one for me in my mid-20s that I kind of figured out, which is like, when you're not shooting well, and you have another tool, which is you're an athlete, go play hard. Like, make plays on defense. Make plays on the glass. Make plays elsewhere, and you will gain confidence knowing that you're impacting winning outside of the shot, which will put you in a position when when you're shooting, you don't have as much pressure on your mind to make the shot because you know even if you miss it, you're helping the team elsewhere. And so, again, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as just a couple of different examples, especially for young basketball players out there, for how to deal with when you're in a slump. Work harder off the court, work harder on the court, and then as a team, play better fluid and motion basketball to keep everybody involved. 